So for all of you who are running a Cassandra cluster in production, I am hoping from this session that you are going to have a ton of things to think about and to investigate and to take home. This, the session's title was Popular Cassandra Problems um, I, and How to Fix Them. I lied to you. I'm, I'm taking you for a ride. Um, it's going to be Popular Cassandra Fixes because the amount of content that I've got, it could be a full day workshop. Um, so I'm going to run through it very quickly. And I won't have time to talk about how you verify the problems to these fixes exist or how to verify that the fixes have actually worked for you or how to make those fixes optimal. So, do not take anything in this session, any of the hot list of fixes that I have to give you, and just make changes without doing your homework and your due diligence first. I have to repeat that. Do not take any of my advice in this session and just make those changes. So as I said, there's a ton of details, and it's because this is basically just a load dump of the health check report that we built up at the last pickle. So we're talking about a decade, two decades worth of Cassandra expertise accumulated and hundreds, possibly a thousand, of production clusters analyzed. This job is usually three days worth of work per cluster, and the report is often up to 100 pages long. So I'm going to try and just skim through it as quickly as I can for you um, in 30 minutes. Now, in the photo of the last pickles, uh, Anthony and Radovan are missing. And I would also like to give a special shout out to Andrew Hogg and Phil Meisley, uh, who have taken this on this work on in Datastacks. Uh, and, and improved it even more. Briefly about myself, um, I've always been involved in open source. It's just obvious, isn't it? I hope. Um, and what's interesting is like, like as, as a kid, if you'd asked me, I would have given you uh, um, ideology or, 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 or reasons of principle. And now, and especially looking back at, at, at what I was involved in over time, I can see the pragmatism. And, you know, it was really always just about solving the problems that I had at work faster. It was just like, I've got a problem, let's look around for something and rip. That was it. So I think pragmatism is... is far more valuable uh, reason to do open source than we realize. Okay, so down to business. I'm going to break this up into six, six, six sections. Um, and within each of these sections, I'm going to break them down into three further subsections. I'm going to talk about the, the fixes that come immediately, the fixes that you should be doing in the near term, that is like in a three to six month time frame, and the fixes that you should be doing a long term. Now, this isn't talking to the severity of those problems. This is a trade-off between the severity and uh, the cost of change, the risk involved, uh, and, and, and you know, the, the, the cost of verifying both the problem and, and the changes. So first up, infrastructure. The infrastructure has a base slide to it. Um, and these are just the, some of the base recommendations uh, that, you th th that you should be uh, aware of. Cassandra nodes um, uh, only really only work in a certain range of specs. So we say from 8 to uh, 16 cores and 32 to 64 gigs of RAM is good for a production node. If you have nodes which are over 20 cores or over 120 gig uh, of RAM, you're really not going to utilize those machines. Um, and so the recommendation there is to, to either use con containers, use Kubernetes, the Kate Sandra project, for example, or from 4.0 onwards, you can actually, because all the ports can be configured, run multiple nodes per port. 
Uh, this may change, especially as we see, you know, what tries is happening, tries is doing with the mem tables, and, and if they become properly off heap. Uh, this may change over time, so pay attention to it. Um, the other one is use separate dedicated disks for each node. Uh, disks are usually in the category of about two to eight terabytes. Um, that's because you don't want to fill them up more than 50%, and the, the popular, the, the size tiered and the leveled compression strategies, um, they don't really want to work over ter four terabyte. We have seen time window compression strategy tables kind of go up to 16 terabytes, um, and those work. It will still make your range movements or streaming incredibly painful. So that is a recommendation. Again, with 5.0, with unified compaction strategy, and with the tries, mem table and uh, SS table, this is going to change. We're going to see the ability to store a lot more data per node. Um, okay, and, um, and don't use SAN. Uh, don't use SAN because an angel dies every time someone has to tell a Cassandra user, don't use SAN. I'm not going to explain it. Um, a simple benchmark uh, to, to, to run uh, if you have infra people who are trying to force a SAN disk onto you or something, is run a 10,000 IOPS uh, soak test on each node at the same time. That is your baseline. If you can't do that, if the controller uh, starts to jam up, the production cost is not going to work very well. Okay, jumping into the immediate concerns. Um, okay, I have hygiene in place for upgrading always the latest Jetta Kit patch and the latest uh, Cassandra version. Um, you know, it's such an obvious advice, but we just jump into so many clusters and they're just behind. This should just be automatic um, for you. Use the Kyber IO scheduler. Um, the the NOOP is also quite popular for a lot of people. Uh, it's hard to give an, an absolute definite advice for everyone on this one, but we have seen Kyber again and again just be the right choice. Uh, disable swab. A lot of people just kind of, like, we always say, you know, swab off and VM swappiness to, to, to one. Not zero because there was a kernel bug at one time where zero would um, cause problems. And we say it's really important to do both. People say, like, why? Um, one's enough. And the problem is that uh, kernel upgrades and other things can happen at, at the infrastructure side, often by different teams, and a swab setting can accidentally, accidentally be undone and that can have a cluster-wide impact and, and bring cluster down. So it's a line of defense. Um, otherwise, the, the, the Cassandra 3 prod settings recommendations on the DataStacks website is really good. I hope we can upstream them. Um, that's a pretty good baseline. Uh, yeah, otherwise gonna keep moving. Okay, so critical items here, um, like the near-term items. Have an NTP client running on every node and every client application server. More than that, it has to be part of your monitoring and you have to have alerts set up for clock drift. Trying to debug problems related to clock drift in a Cassandra cluster are an absolute nightmare. Um, also pay attention to failed repair logs uh, and P99 latency changes. So long-term infrastructure, uh, things to do. If you are using multiple data directories in Cassandra, stop. Replace that with LVMs. There are so many bugs and, and limitations around the multi-data directory setups in Cassandra. Uh, just don't do it. Also, major Cassandra upgrades are more involved than people think. They require a lot of planning um, and a number of careful sequential steps to do properly. Uh, there is a great documentation on this on the DataStacks website, um, which we are Again, hoping to upstream to the Cassandra website. Um, a quick note on the, the, the EOLs. The Cassandra community has recently agreed that it will only maintain the last three branches. So that it effectively puts an EOL on uh, that fourth branch. People panic about this, um, but you know, I hate to tell you, open source doesn't give you support. Um, you know, if, if, if you're that worried ab about EOL branches, maybe you should go to a vendor and, and, and sign up for support. Um, what we mean is we've simply recognized that the number of contributors and the number of committers that we've got in the project, we really can't man more than three branches. 
So th that is what we're committed to. So we're not gonna see bug fixes from that group of people on older branches. CVEs, maybe. It depends. Again, you may be asking us to work on weekends, and we'll, we'll make that decision. Um, and of course, vendors, they can come in and they can say, we would like to support older branches. And, and if they bring in contributors who put in, bring in fixes, that will change. Okay, so moving on to configuration. Um, consistent config on all nodes. Okay, so many of the things I'm gonna list here are just so obvious. Um, but the number of clusters that we've seen and every YAML file is different. Um, it's, it's horrifying and that's why there's monk scream there because these are the things that I, uh, I'm embarrassed to be up here talking about. Um, logging, it's not a big deal, but the logging is by default configured with uh, logging to two places, to file and to standard out, and very few of you will need both places, um, and typically not the standard outs turned off. Um, garbage collection, uh, just use G1. Even on the newer JDKs, uh, we see benchmarks where ZGC or Shenandoah on certain use cases perform better. Um, sure, but what we're seeing is that G1 is actually really good. It's up there and it's just easier to use um, and it's what you should have anyway. Uh, your best setting for Heath is about 20 to 24 gig, do not go over 31. And uh, for the best G1 settings, look at the trunk or 5.0 JVM options file. Also, make sure to set uh, floor the new size of the heap. Um, set it to about one third or to half. The G1 is supposed to, with the ergonomics uh, adjust, it just never gets there uh, with the new heap. So you've got to give it this hint to get to the right place quickly. Uh, the other one, off heap and tables. Um, this gives you a 10% right throughput increase. This is one to test. Uh, there are some cases where it won't work for you, though the two main bugs that I know that people uh, hit that prevented them from using off heap have been addressed. Um, so I think that advice comes in even stronger. Moving on. Uh, so near term configuration changes. Uh, you should have for each DC three seeds listed, and each node should list those three seeds from every DC consistently. Uh, the failure policies that you have in the YAML never do best effort. It's really a choice between uh, stop and die. And there it's a choice between whether, do you have a monitoring system that can actually uh, detect and flag a node that is down, that is in that stop zombie mode? Um, or do you have a system that's going to automatically restart Cassandra if you do kill it? Um, so depending on how your system is set up, you've got to choose these ones correctly. Once your cluster is operating well and you've got decent hardware, uh, jump into the Cassandra YAML and add this dynamic snitch uh, disabled. Um, it gets in the way on well-performing on well-performing clusters. And since Cassandra 4.1, we have guardrails eat your heart out on them. They are a lifesaver for operators. Uh, there's heaps of them, and they just keep on getting added to uh, from everybody because everyone is seeing an immense amount of value on them. Long-term changes. Um, keep an eye out for ring imbalance. Um, that can cause problems over time and it's a little bit of a hard one to, to fix in, in large clusters or over capacity clusters. Uh, there's a new setting, allocate tokens for local replication factor since 4.0, take advantage of it. And when you use that, don't worry about small imbalances that you see, because the point of that uh, allocation algorithm is to account for future nodes, and so it kind of is always a little bit off, um, but it makes sure that each step stays within a certain error uh, margin. Also, we are currently working on a Cassandra latest YAML file that should land, I think, in the next week or two. Uh, that is really, for new clusters, the, the set of options that you should be using. We can't put that into the Cassandra YAML file because for the, the Cassandra YAML file has to look after people who are upgrading. So it's got all the conservative defaults 
keeping in mind people who are upgrading. The Cassandra YAML is what we'll be pointing uh, anyone who wants to do benchmarking or to kind of replay with Cassandra to. Okay, so moving on to data model. This is a big one. Um, the two big issues in data modeling uh, would be tombstones and wide, large, or hot partitions. Um, you know, I, I'm not going to go into them, but, but kind of a number of the issues will kind of touch on them. So the hot, the hot or the critical list is remove unused tables. Uh, tables have a memory overhead in Cassandra. Cassandra is not a good place to park data. Um, so if you have tables, if you've just like taken kind of like copies of something and there was no longer any reads happening on those tables, get them out of your cluster. Uh, disable both the local and the DC local read repair chance. Um, this reduces 5 to 20% load on your cluster. And the, this, this uh, async read repair chance, it offers no operational guarantees. So there's really, there's nothing that you can work with in a concrete way, and it adds a significant amount of load to the cluster. In the recent patch versions of all of our branches, it has been removed. Compression chunk length. Uh, bring it down to 16K. If you've got skinny rows, even bring it down to 4K. Um, and then once you've done that, upgrade SS tables to, uh, so that the compression kicks in. It's only going to work if you've also put your disk read ahead to 4K. That was a really important one. I skipped over it. Um, they go hand in hand. Make sure your dev teams or your applications are syncing their schema changes. Um, as an operator dealing with schema disagreements can quickly turn into a huge nightmare. Um, Yes, it's kind of supposed to be able to do concurrent schema changes, but in practice, you're, you're living on the edge. Get the dev teams to sync their schema changes. This changes in 5.1 with transactional cluster metadata, where you will be able to do unlimited concurrent schema changes. Disable a row cache really never works, especially over time. People set it up, they kind of tune it, it works. Six months later, a year later, it just don't. Um, there are better ways to do that. Also, check your prepared statements in the clients Again and again and again, we see string literals sneak into those prepared statements, and that thrashes the prepared statement cache on the server. Um, it's something to keep an eye out. And there's no way to hide enforce it. Enforce it. Near term. It's a long slide, I know. Don't do secondary indexes before SAI. Um, favor denormalization. Don't uh, try to avoid unfrozen collections and UDTs. The performance difference between and the problems that you encounter between frozen and unfrozen is significant. So whenever you're using UDTs or collections, uh, if you can freeze them, just do it. Uh, if you're using unfrozen lists, don't uh, try to use a map or a list or uh, add a clustering key instead. Uh, list collection time unfrozen is not good. Don't use materialized views ever. Sorry. Um, I'm not going to go into that one. Uh, uh, there's a whole section here on compaction strategies. I'm not really going to go into that because with 5.0, we've got the unified compaction strategy. Um, and you really just, like, just upgrade and just start using that. Uh, again, um, unlocked batches, uh, they're only for a single partition. People think that they're a wonderful performance gain. They're not. Cassandra likes uh, concurrent, inf like small concurrent requests. Uh, this idea of kind of trying to batch up a write even within a single partition, it does not work. Um, maybe like between 10 and 50 rows max in an unlocked partition may give you a small benefit. Um, don't go beyond that. Logged batches, uh, their failure modes don't give you any guarantee. Um, they trip people up. Uh, there's a little bit more dev work and complexity. 
um, to just do it manually by ordering the writes and, and then ordering the reads in the, in the opposite way. Um, uh, with a retry logic in place, it's usually a much better solution. Again, Cassandra 5.1 with a cord fixes that problem for you. Do you see grace seconds is an interesting one. We see again and again People play with GC Gray seconds to try and fix their tombstone problems. It is not the first thing for you to play with. Um, it's nearly always done wrong. And GC Gray seconds has a number of constraints uh, or interac odd interactions with it. Um, first of all, you've got to be running repairs within your GC Gray seconds. That's the easy one. But it also plays with the max hint window and the TTL. And it, you get some um, odd behavior. Uh, if your GC Gray seconds uh, it goes low or above those, below some of those values. Uh, we have an excellent blog post on the last Bickle website that goes into that in more detail. Um, also, configure your speculative retry, both server side and client side, to hard coded millisecond values. Uh, Usually something between the P75 and the P90 uh, latencies during normal operations uh, is, is a decent starting place for you to think about. It really depends on how much you're willing to sacrifice load overhead for a bit better performance. Um, but when you do that, also at some point go and test that the cluster can still run when speculative retry is at all. Otherwise, you have a cascading failure problem. Long-term issues. Don't overuse lightweight transactions. Uh, lightweight transactions, they do hit contentions. They do time out. Um, if you have a lot of lightweight transactions, I recommend you to upgrade to 4.1. Uh, and when you upgrade to 4.1, it does not automatically use the second version of Paxis. So the second version of Paxis that came in 4.1, it halved the number of network trips. So you're going from four network trips down to two network trips. That's a huge improvement on your cluster. But the problem is it doesn't automatically use it. There are some manual commands, and as far as I know, they're not documented anywhere. So good luck with that. <laughs> um, no, you reach out and ask. Um, don't do more than 1,000 tables. And designed for collections less than a thousand. Yeah, the limit is 64k. But what we see is that at design time, you're kind of going already over a thousand. Then in production, in a year, you're going to be in pain. Um, so at design time, you think those collections are going to need thousands of entries. Try and find a different solution for that. Okay, jumping into operations. If you're not familiar with the OODA loop from the US Air Force, please read up on it. The basic idea is that you take these sequential steps before you take any action. You sit down and you collect observations in an unbiased manner. You get as much observations as you can, then you start to orientate. Then you allow your biases to come into the picture. Then you build hypotheses and you weigh multiple hypotheses and you weigh them up against each other. And then you make a decision. At any of these steps, you eagerly go back to collect more observations. And once you're confident, you make that change and you verify the change. And if it was no good, you undo and start again. Your monitoring systems, your logging systems, your tracing systems, your backups, all of those emergency ops, they have to work when your platform is on fire. These infrastructure tools need better availability and redundancy uh, in, in many situations than the production system itself. You know, because when the, production, when the production system is on fire, you are dependent upon them to see what the problem is so it does not happen again. So operations uh, near term. Okay, keep an eye on wide, large hot petitions. Um, it was interesting in a number of other, another session uh, at this summit, people were saying 10 megs. Um, I go with that. Um, 
the hard limits really for a wire petition before 3.11 was 100 meg. Um, I say a soft limit would be 10 meg, that was accurate. Uh, from 3.11 upwards, uh, we can actually handle wide petitions a bit better. Uh, so the hard limit then moves up to about a gig. This is not talking about large petitions, large column uh, of data cells. Um, and it's not talking about hot petitions. Long list here. Um, anything I'm super interested in talking about? Okay, so two items here. What's your per table compression ratios? Um, one of the things that we see in, in, in nearly all of our reports is that there is maybe 10% um, of the tables are not getting any benefit whatsoever from compression. You know, it's super simple. Just jump in, just turn compression off on those tables. Um, otherwise, you know, there's, there's you know, half of the, the remaining tables, simple adjustments could save 10% disk usage for you. Uh, I know, like, I was, we were speaking about this the other day, and, you know, like the engineers in the room immediately jumped on. It's like, yes, yes, and we should come up with this new compression algorithm, and we could you know, have a, a custom dictionary based on the, the data you've already got, and they have even better compression ratios. And for me, that was a little bit like when you talk about climate change and people talk about brand new technology that they want to invent, and they're like, just stop it. All the solutions are out there already. <laughs> just get to it and fix it. Um, Low-hanging fruit. Uh, but people don't do it because it, it, it's quite cumbersome and takes a bit of time. Um, the other one was... Watch out for anti-compactions. Again and again and again, we see clusters thrashing around with anti-compactions. And we say, you're doing incremental repairs. And they're like, no. And like, wow. It's like, like repo or your schedule repairs are not got incremental repairs anywhere. And what happened was some operator at some point run one incremental repair, and that put repair that timestamps on the SS tables. And from that moment onwards, you had anti-compactions running in the background. You're basically doubling your um, repair load. And it's a bit cumbersome to the go through. You've got to kind of turn off the node and unset all of those repaired at timestamps and turn it back on to get out of that situation. In long term, things to check out for. Uh, um, you know, test your hint window and your uh, the replay speed of it. Um, it's one of those things that uh, people don't find out until they've had a node down for an hour or two um, that they can't actually get that node up and running again. And it's because the, the hint replay is working too fast. Um, you know, you've just got too much in your hints. Um, so take the time when you can to figure out uh, what's the correct uh, throttling rate for hint replays, especially when you have like an hour or two worth of hints. Okay, so security. Only one s slide? No, a couple of slides for security. Uh, Low-hanging fruit. In the Cassandra YAML, there's a number of kind of like interval in milliseconds or validation period in milliseconds. I think there's six of them. Um, there may be nine of them now, I can't, I can't remember. They're all set to quite low values, increase them all up to 30 seconds. Um, you know, having, like, if there's a problem there or, like, there's, there's checking your, 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 your auth tables and roles tables too often, um, that can cause problems. The other one is the system auth key space. Uh, increase its replication up to the number of nodes you've got, um, or just, like, a higher number, like five or even more, um, and use NTS uh, so you make sure you've got copies of it in each data center. And yeah, do I have to say it? Don't expose JMX uh, <laughs> off the machine if you haven't done your security properly on it. Um, don't use the default super user Cassandra user, uh, and that is because. With that user, all internal requests around it, use quorum. As soon as you create additional users and super users, they then use uh, consistency level one. So the, the default Cassandra super user 
can actually get you stuck and cause problems. Set up your users and then uh, disable that one. Okay, long term. Um, there is so much to go through here. This is some basic, basic highlights. Um, the problem with security is there are no half measures. Uh, you really need to do everything here properly, carefully. Just go read Nate McCall's uh, blog post, The Last Pickle. Um, he goes through all the steps well. On The Last Pickle, there's also some additional blog posts you know, around the requiring the client authentication, which is really important. It's a must. And uh, if you're using a common CA, you should also do hostname verification. Okay, last slide of the deck. Uh, it's called troubleshooting, but you know I probably could have called it verification, uh, because when I say you know ver verify the problem, and verify the fix, the method is pretty similar to troubleshooting. Um, so one thing, one of my favorite things uh, to tell people is be familiar with the P95 to P99 spread derivative, and what I mean by that, and this is to both read and write latencies, is that you look at the gap between your P95 and your P99 latencies and how that changes over your daily traffic shape and how much it pulls apart in peak traffic. And then look at that over 3, 6, 12 months. That's going to give you some interesting insights as to the saturation of your cluster and, and saturation growing over time, as well as potential hardware problems and other kind of like non-Cassandra problems that may pop, it, pop in. If you have any problems with CPU, with CPU uh, increasing, CPU getting saturated, take a flame graph before you do anything. Like even if you're 100% confident what the problem is, please, for the love of God, just take a flame graph. Um, flame graphs are also a fantastic way of getting into the code of Cassandra. Uh, it's, it's not the best code base uh, to begin learning with and to sit down and to try and just start reading it from scratch is pretty painful, but the flame graphs are actually a really uh, fun way to get into the code base. Also be familiar, async profiler to the flame graphs, uh, these tools, dstat to iftop. Uh, if you've got a newer version, start learning the BCC tools. And for your GC profiling, even though G1 is pretty good if using those latest GVM settings, you probably don't have to, but if you want to do GC tuning, just go and use the GC Easy website. It's, it's, it's fantastic and it's free. That's me. Thank you very much. And a quick plug to Community Over Code happening in Europe uh, next June. If, if you're from Europe, are you close by? Please come and join us there. Thank you. Questions? I will load them up. Yep, thank you for reminding me. Question, Polo. Uh, again, a thousand. But yeah, I didn't put that in. Um, there's there's a number of things I could. Have. The list is long. Um, so again, it was a, the popular problems. Uh, the high column count. We don't see it that often now and again, but not not that often. Yep. Yes. Yes, we recommend them. Um, absolutely. Uh, nearly all of the time, it reduce, it's, it's much, much lighter than running full repairs. Caveats with incremental, incremental repairs is that uh, in a lot of clusters, you will still need to do token, like break it up into smaller repairs because not every incremental repair is necessarily small. If you're like loading, if you've got a table where you're doing full dice set loads, like once a night, um, then that incremental repair is still a full repair and you'll have to tune it the way you did before. Um, and also, you still need to uh, do full repairs every couple of months, maybe, like for the sake of disk rot. You've got SSDs, 
um, it's, it's still helpful to, to do those full repairs sometimes. Your question was on timeout values. Um, the valid reason for increasing timeout values uh, is, for example, with if you have analytics DC uh, or your client is not low latency. Like if you have an application which is more throughput based, um, then you're 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 going to throttle the configure. You're going to tune or throttle the configuration based on throughput, not on SLAs or SLOs. So that's why people increase the timeout values. We have no way, like, um, we have no way of quality of service, so it, like, it, like, if you have to have like ad hoc queries on your cluster and you know that they run forever and so then you have to kind of increase that timeout and that sucks because 99% of your traffic is actually low latency traffic um, where you would like to have a high, like a low, we don't have a solution for that yet. It, it's been discussed a number of times. I, I know people talk about this. Um, uh, one way to solve that is if you have separate DCs. So you have a DC which is analytics, and then you, you do all ad hoc and all that type of stuff, and then you can configure that differently. But um, if you have a good use case for that, and you like to write it up and submit it, um, like do that to the community, because we need to hear more concrete use cases where we say, yeah, that's legit, um, and we'll start to form kind of more ideas on, on ways to, to solve that. 